Hello, Betty Cubes. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. VK for you, and today I am here to discuss about the subfluidic spaces, and followed by that, I will be discussing about the suprarenal glands. Now, our learning objectives for today will be an introduction about the subfluidic spaces. So, what are subfluidic spaces and how do they differ from the recess? We also have peritoneal spaces and we have peritoneal recess. Then about the classification of these spaces, how they are classified and how many spaces are present. Then the boundaries of these spaces and followed by that the clinical significance of these spaces. Why? We have to have a knowledge about these spaces, whether they are closed spaces or do they communicate with each other. Then, after that, I will be discussing about the suprarenal glands, the gross anatomy of the suprarenal glands, their location, their various parts, relations, their coverings, really their blood supply and their applied aspects. Now, first, let us try to understand the subfluidic spaces. Now, what are actually subfluidic spaces? They are actually spaces in the peritoneal cavity. So, you are able to see. Apart from the peritoneum lining the viscera, like your liver or spleen, stomach, there are certain spaces in between these viscera and they are actually called as the peritoneal spaces. These spaces are seen in the abdomen proper, that is mainly concentrated around the gastrointestinal tract. There are also spaces even in the pelvis, okay, between the uterus and the rectum. Also, you have a space which is called as the recto uterine pouch, especially in case of the females. That is one example of peritoneal space in the pelvis. Now, these spaces are actually potential sites. So, what do you mean by potential sites means? Any fluid collection due to the pathology of the concerned viscera, they tend to collect here or sometimes they might primarily originate in some other place and they might come to tend to actually concentrate here. Okay. Now, for example, the any perforations of the stomach this posterior wall of the stomach, it tends to collect in the lesser sac. If it is the anterior wall of the stomach, then it tends to collect in the left anterior intraperitoneal space. Okay. So, mainly fluid collection or blood due to any rupture of the vessels or if there is any lymphatic vessels rupture, then collection of lymph. Now, they might communicate or track down or sometimes they might show a localized swelling which is called as abscess formation in that area. They might restrict it to that area because if they are not able to communicate to the other places. They might show as cystic swellings which is called as abscess formation. Now, we should try to understand what is the difference between the peritoneal spaces which I have been discussing. The other one is peritoneal recess. So, here in this picture, you are able to see the duodenum is actually continuing as the jejunum, the duodenum jejunal flexure. So, the place where the duodenum, which is an intraperitoneal organ, sorry, a retroperitoneal organ, the duodenum, to the jejunum is entering into the peritoneum entering into the B centri, which is the double layered fold of the peritoneum. So, when they come like this, you will be able to see short pockets of peritoneum. 
which are called as the peritoneal recess. So here you are able to see the supraduodenal recess, infraduodenal recess, retroduodenal recess. Same way you will also see cecal recess, retrocecal recess. So these are small pockets of peritoneum formed by the peritoneal folds. And as a rule, so these folds, that is the places where the peritoneum will form a raised, you can just raise from its normal plate, mainly by the blood vessels. Usually the blood vessels, when they actually, what happens when they, from their retroperitoneal to peritoneum, because most of the blood vessels are in the posterior abdominal wall, the major vessels, they start there. And when they come near the viscera to supply that viscera, they become intraperitoneal. So as they enter the peritoneum, they raise actually folds. Okay. You also have gastropancreatic folds, superior and inferior gastropancreatic folds. So like that, when they raise, naturally they will create small uh, pockets of peritoneum. These pockets, they don't communicate and they are all blind ends. Now, what disadvantages of these recesses is, sometimes the coils of intestine might get herniated. So, they might protrude into this recess and they might get strangulated there. So, then it produces uh, some pathological symptoms where surgical intervention is necessary. Now, before understanding the subfluidic spaces, the whole of the peritoneal cavity is divided into the supracolic compartment and the infracolic compartment. So, supracolic is above the transverse colon and infracolic is actually below the transverse colon. So, mainly the supracolic and infracolic is actually categorized by based on the attachment of this, the fold of the transverse colon, which is called as the transverse mesocolon. So, the line of attachment of the transverse mesocolon divides the whole of the peritoneal cavity into the supracolic compartment and the infracolic compartment. Okay. The other type of division of the peritoneal cavity in a vertical disposition is into a greater sac and a lesser sac. So that is another type of classification. Now, the subfluidic spaces are mainly seen in the supracolic compartment. Okay. So mainly the supracolic compartment you come across these subfluidic spaces. So what are these subfluidic spaces? As I told you earlier, they are peritoneal spaces. They communicate with each other mostly and they are termed mainly sub because they are present below the diaphragm and they are in the supracolic compartment. sub spaces are in the supracolic compartment. They are actually below the diaphragm. So that is why they are called as sub spaces. Now, even though they are below the diaphragm as a general that subclassification, they can be again subclassified. Those which are present below the diaphragm but above the liver as suprahepatic, and those which are present below the liver is actually called as the infrahepatic or subhepatic. Okay. So the liver intervenes between these spaces and divides these spaces into suprahepatic and subhepatic. So, whether it is a suprahepatic space or whether it is a subhepatic space, they both are actually coming under the subfluidic spaces. So, totally there are six spaces. Right side three. So, three on the right side and three on the left side. So, you might again uh, wonder how actually they are categorized into right and left, it is again by the attachment of the falciform ligament. So, by the attachment of the falciform ligament, those spaces which are to the right of the falciform ligament are the right subfluidic spaces. Those to the left of the falciform ligament are actually called as the 
left subfluidic spaces. So, whether it is right or left subfluidic spaces, each side you have what suprahepatic, what subhepatic, and what extra peritoneal space. So, which is not lighted by peritoneum, you have what space. 3 like that on the right side. Same way on the left side, you have left suprahepatic or anterior space, then left subhepatic or posterior intraperitoneal space, then you have the left extraperitoneal space. Okay. So, 3 on the right side, 3 on the left side by the attachment of the falciform ligament. So, a general classification of the subfluidic spaces. So, the subfluidic spaces, since it is intervened by the liver, can be divided into suprahepatic and subhepatic. So, both suprahepatic and subhepatic, we have right and the left space by the attachment of the falciform ligament. So, to the right of falciform ligament, you have right anterior, what suprahepatic, right posterior, subhepatic, and right extraperitoneal. And it is the same for the left also. Left anterior suprahepatic, that is to the left of falciform ligament, all these things. Left posterior subhepatic, which is called as the subhepatic space, and the left extraperitoneal space. Now, we will try to understand these spaces one by one. The so first is the right suprahepatic space. So, the right suprahepatic space is actually present immediately below the diaphragm. Okay. It is above the liver, so it is a suprahepatic space and below the diaphragm, so it is a subfluidic space and it is to the right of the falciform ligament. So, it is a right suprahepatic space. So, here you are able to see this space is actually the suprahepatic space. Anteriorly, you will have the anterior abdominal wall. Anteriorly, you have the anterior abdominal wall and the diaphragm. Posteriorly, you have the right lobe, anterior surface of the right lobe of the liver. Okay. So, anteriorly, anterior abdominal wall and diaphragm, as I told you. Posteriorly, what you see is the right lobe of the liver. Okay. Really, the anterior surface of the right lobe of the liver and superior layer of coronary ligament. That is the reflection of peritoneum from the diaphragm to the liver. Right lobe of the liver is actually called as the superior layer of coronary ligament behind. Okay. Above, you have the diaphragm. So, above diaphragm, you remember? In front, the anterior abdominal wall. Behind is the right lobe of the liver, anterior surface of the right lobe of the liver, and the superior layer of coronary ligament. Okay. <coughs> Below, it is actually continuous with the right subhepatic space. So, continuous along the right surface and inferior border of the liver. The right suprahepatic space communicates with the right subhepatic space. Okay. So, around the inferior border, posteriorly, you will see the inferior layer of coronary ligament. So, you should remember the right suprahepatic space communicates with the right subhepatic space. So, that is the suprahepatic space you are able to see here, which is present immediately below the diaphragm. And uh, this is your anterior abdominal wall. So, anterior abdominal wall to the front. The right lobe anterior surface is actually behind, and also the superior layer of coronary ligament, this double layered fold, is behind. It is continuous with a subhepatic, right subhepatic space, which is limited posteriorly by the inferior layer of coronary ligament, by the inferior layer of the coronary ligament. Now, 
what is the importance of these spaces? So, any perforation of the or any surgical procedures of the anterior wall of the stomach, anterior wall of the stomach, the fluid collection will take place in the right suprahepatic space and that fluid might actually track down and communicate also to the left sub right subhepatic space. From suprahepatic on the right side, it might track down also to the right subhepatic because this space communicates with the subhepatic space. The next space, this space I have already discussed in my peritoneal class, the right subhepatic space which is the hepatorenal pouch or the Borisets pouch. The most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity in the recumbent position. Okay. So, it is the below the liver, right side, to the right of falciform ligament below the liver. So, it is the right subhepatic space which is nothing but the Borisets pouch or the hepatorenal pouch, the most dependent part of the peritoneal cavity. So, in front we have the inferior surface, right lobe of the liver and we also have the inferior layer of coronary ligament. So, behind it is related to the anterior surface of right kidney, right suprarenal gland, right colic flexure or the hepatic flexure where the ascending colon continues as the transverse colon. So, posterior relations are mainly your right suprarenal gland, anterior surface of right kidney, right colic flexure, but you can include the second part of the duodenum, which is also a retroperitoneal structure. Above, as I told you, inferior layer of coronary ligament. So, this line is the inferior layer of the coronary ligament. Okay. The superior layer of the coronary ligament and the inferior layer of the coronary ligament unite on the right side to form the right triangular ligament. So, inferior layer is actually labeled as the lower layer of the coronary ligament. So, here you are able to see the right subhepatic space. So, behind you have the anterior surface of right kidney, second part of the duodenum, colic flexure. So, anteriorly you have the liver, inferior surface of the liver. Now, this space communicates below with the right paracolic gutter, that is to the infracolic compartment. So, it communicates to the infracolic compartment to the right paracolic gutter. So, as I told you, here they are, this picture depicts the dependent part of the peritoneal cavities in the recumbent position. The hepatorenal pouch and other one is the Douglas of the uterine pouch in case of the females. So, in recumbent position, the hepatorenal pouch is the most dependent part. Any collection of fluid in the peritoneal cavity tends to come and collect here. So, it communicates also with the lesser sac through the epiploic foramen. So, any posterior perforations of the wall of the stomach will collect in the lesser sac. From there, the fluid might actually track down to this hepatorenal pouch. The subphrenic abscess mainly due to here you are able to see mainly apart from the what I told you the posterior perforations of the peptic ulcers or the duodenum which is going to collect here in the lesser sac by track to the subhepatic space even appendicitis okay because this subhepatic space communicates with the paracolic gutter. So, in the recumbent position, when you lie down, what happens is any rupture of the appendix or any fluid collection due to the infection of the appendicitis might also track down to the subhepatic space. Then, inflammation of the gallbladder. 
but also leads to the abscess formation in the subhepatic space and as I told you a perforated appendix. So communications mainly subhepatic below communicates with the paracolic gutter, the infracolic compartment and remember the right suprahepatic space communicates with the subhepatic space. So we are finished with the right anterior suprahepatic, right posterior subhepatic Next, we are coming to the right extra peritoneal space. I need not discuss much about this. You already know which is this is nothing but the bad area of the liver, which is bounded above by the superior layer of coronary ligament, below by the inferior layer of the coronary ligament. Apex is formed by the union of the superior layer and inferior layer, that is the right triangular ligament. Apex. Base is formed by the groove for inferior vena cava on the left of the base. It is formed by the groove for the inferior vena cava. Okay. So this is actually the bad area of the liver. The importance of bad area of the liver is it is one of the site of the portosystemic adastabosis. Portosystemic adastabosis. So hepatic uh, portal radicals they actually adastabose in the subdiaphragmatic veins. What are the site of portosystemic adastabosis? Bad area of the liver. So we are finished with the three spaces on the right side. We will move on to the left side. So the left of the falciform ligament, as I mentioned, we have three spaces. Left anterior, intraperitoneal, which is a suprahepatic space. Then we have the left posterior subhepatic space. Then we have the left extra peritoneal space. In front anterior abdominal wall, same as the right space. Behind it will be related to the anterior surface of the left lobe of the liver, stomach, and spleen. At the left triangular ligament. Apart from the liver, stomach, and spleen, the left triangular ligament, which is nothing but the reflection of the, the union of the falciform, left layer of the falciform ligament from the diaphragm, reflects as the left triangular ligament. So here you are able to see the left triangular ligament. The left layer of falciform ligament, after joining the peritoneum from the diaphragm here, reflex as the left triangular ligament. So anteriorly anterior abdominal wall, posteriorly left triangular ligament, left surface of uh, the liver, then we have the stomach and the spleen. Okay. Above diaphragm, same as the right uh, suprahepatic space, below it is opened into the infracolic space. So below again it is open. That means it might communicate to the infracolic compartment below the transverse colon. So, as I told you, the abscess formation due to surgical procedures, the stomach, spleen, or tail of pancreas or left colic flexure, fluid tends to collect here. Okay. So, or any sometimes perforations of the anterior wall of the stomach due to ulcers or due to any trauma or injury to the stomach or spleen or tail of the pancreas, what happens is there will be abscess formation in the left anterior intraperitoneal space. Coming to the left the posterior intraperitoneal space which is behind the stomach. So we all have discussed, I have already discussed about this which is nothing but the lesser sac or obental bursa. The lesser sac or obental bursa is the left posterior intraperitoneal space. So it is called as an offshoot or di diverticulum of the greater sac. So you have the greater sac here. Behind the stomach you have a small area of peritoneal light space which is called as the lesser sac. And both communicate via the uh, epiploic foramen. So it is closed on all sides above, below and also to the 
left to side only to the right it is open it communicates to the epiploic foramen and that is why it is actually shaped like a hot water bag so that is the lesser sac which communicates with the greater sac through the epiploic foramen and remember through the epiploic foramen we immediately come to lie in this space of the greater peritoneum greater sac which is the this space is below the liver which is nothing but the right subfreedic space or the hepatorenal pouch which we have discussed a few minutes back okay so that is about the lesser sac and this is the recess the superior recess and inferior recess and you also have the left recess of the lesser sac okay so closed on all sides except communicates to the epiploic foramen to the right through which it communicates with the borisens pouch or the hepatorenal pouch of borisen so here fluid collection or abscess formation mainly due to perforation of the posterior wall of the stomach or it might lead to <coughs> pancreas abscess formation due to pancreatitis acute pancreatitis it might form a pseudocyst of the pancreas so again pseudocyst of the pancreas all i have discussed in my second part of the peritoneum class under the clinical correlations okay these are the two main reasons where the fluid might collect and from here it might also track down to the right subhepatic space of the hepatorenal pouch finally the last space is the left extra peritoneal space a very small space which is corresponding to the bare area of the stomach so it is present the bare area of the stomach in front and behind you have the left supra renal gland kidney and the diaphragm so this small space the bare area of stomach is actually present uh, at the upper part cardiac end of the stomach behind the cardiac end of the stomach you have very small area behind the cardiac end of the stomach which is not covered by the peritoneum and called as the bare area so posterior to that space and in front of the left kidney at the suprarenal gland you have this space it's the site of peripheric abscess left extra peritoneal space is due to abscess formation in the kidney leading to peri defect abscess diseases of the kidney so with this i have completed the subphrenic spaces so the subphrenic spaces the importance which i have discussed is because of fluid collections so for any surgical interventions and knowledge of these spaces are definitely necessary you should know from where the original pathology would have arise if you see a fluid collection in these spaces and from there these spaces where do they communicate so the fluid might communicate to what all spaces now i will come to the suprarenal glands or the adrenal glands so there are a pair of suprarenal glands each is present on top of the kidney so that is why it is actually called as the suprarenal glands they are endocrine glands golden yellow in color because they are endocrine they are also called as ductless glands because their secretions are directly poured to the blood stream because of that their effect is actually wide spread they are not actually restricted to any particular or a localized area so you have right suprarenal and the left suprarenal glands paravertebral on either side of the vertebral column as i told you the name itself suggests they are suprarenal because they are present on the upper pole of the kidney so they are golden yellow in color the right and left the shape varies the right suprarenal gland is somewhat pyramidal in shape the left suprarenal gland is semi lunar in shape it has got a outer cortex and inner medulla both are functionally developmentally structurally two distinct areas okay 
so they show structural variations both the cortex and medulla functionally the cortex function is different from the medulla and developmentally also they are from two sources so we will try to understand the relations the parts and other anatomical aspects of the suprarenal gland it is a retroperitoneal organ so situated in the posterior abdominal wall behind the peritoneal cavity lined by the peritoneum only in the front okay so the coverings it has got a true capsule and it has got a false capsule the true capsule is a condensation of the fibrous stroma of the gland the false capsule is actually derived from the renal fascia the renal fascia covers the kidney then it fuses out the upper pole of the kidney then again splits to yet close the suprarenal glands after it closing these two glands they again fuse and get attached to the under surface of the diaphragm as the suspensory ligament of the gland okay it is the renal fascia which encloses the suprarenal gland again fuses at the upper part of the gland and gets attached to the diaphragm as the suspensory ligament that is about the coverings of the adrenal gland or the suprarenal gland now coming to the relations both the glands the relations the shape is different first we will see about the right suprarenal gland which is triangular in nature or pyramidal it has got an apex it has got a base it has got an anterior surface it has got a posterior surface it has a medial border and a lateral border so the apex is overlapped by the inferior vena cava so here the inferior vena cava is cut so if you if the inferior vena cava is present here then you can imagine it overlaps the apex so the apex is actually overlapped by the inferior vena cava base is related to the upper pole of the kidney the base is actually related to the upper pole of the kidney surfaces we have two surface as i told you the anterior surface which can be again divided by a ridge into medial part and the lateral part so medially again related to the ivc and laterally it will be related to the liver especially the bare area of the liver the lateral part of the right suprarenal gland anterior surface comes in contact so the lateral part related to the hepatic region the medial part is related to the inferior vena cava this is for the anterior surface posterior surface can be related to upper part and the lower part above right crust of the diaphragm and below again to the kidney okay so the anterior surface related mostly to the ivc and the liver posterior surface is mainly related to the diaphragm the right crust of the diaphragm and below it is related to the kidney then you have the medial border two borders medial border and the lateral border medial border you see the hilum here to the apex here to the apex you see the hilum of the gland lateral border is again related to the liver right celiac ganglia okay it is actually the right celiac ganglia it is also related between the right suprarenal gland and the left suprarenal gland the space is approximately 5 cm structures intervening between these two is right celiac ganglia and right inferior phrenic artery abdominal aorta then you have the left celiac ganglia and left inferior phrenic artery so these structures intervene between the two medial borders of the suprarenal gland at some times you have the azygos vein also if it is arising as a lumbar azygos 
lumbar azygos okay and one more structure is the cisterna kylie okay the cisterna kylie is also related between these two suprarenal glands so medial border near to the apex what you have is the hilum through which the right suprarenal vein emerges so the hilum of both the suprarenal glands the only the suprarenal vein emerges the artery does not enter to the hilum okay so two borders medial border and lateral border two surfaces we have seen anterior surface and posterior surface two ends what we have seen is the apex and the base coming to the left suprarenal gland it is semiludar in shape or crescent shape it has got a anterior surface and a posterior surface the anterior surface is mainly related can be divided into an upper area and a lower area it is mainly related to the stomach lesser sac of the stomach above and below it will be related to the pancreas left the suprarenal gland so above it will be related to the stomach below it will be related to the pancreas and the splenic vessels okay so left the suprarenal gland below it is related to the splenic vessels and the pancreas above it will be related to the stomach especially the lesser stack of the stomach posterior surface it will be related to the diaphragm mainly the left crust of the diaphragm so you are able to see the left crust medially it will be related to the left crust laterally it will be related to the kidney itself so laterally it will be related to the left kidney okay so that is about the anterior and posterior relations of the left suprarenal gland then coming to the borders you have the medial border related to the left celiac ganglia and the left inferior phrenic artery left celiac ganglia the left inferior phrenic artery lateral border near to the anterior surface you have the hilum okay near the lower end of the anterior surface you have the hilum to which the left suprarenal vein emerges the left suprarenal vein actually emerges from the lower part of the anterior surface whereas in case of the right suprarenal gland it is near to the apex or the medial border blood supply so the blood supply is very very important with respect to any endocrine glands so this adrenal or the suprarenal gland has a very rich blood supply three sets of arteries superior suprarenal middle suprarenal and inferior suprarenal the superior suprarenal is from inferior phrenic artery which is a direct branch from the abdominal aorta okay inferior phrenic artery is from abdominal aorta and superior suprarenal artery is a branch from inferior phrenic artery middle suprarenal directly from the abdominal aorta middle suprarenal artery then you have the inferior suprarenal artery from the renal arteries so inferior suprarenal arteries is actually from the right and left renal arteries so they directly pierce the gland they do not enter through the hilum then they form minor capillaries and from there what happens is the veins start veins they start and then finally what happens you have the suprarenal vein which emerges from the hilum right suprarenal vein drains into the ivc and left the suprarenal vein actually drains into the left renal vein okay right one directly drains into the ivc the left one drains into the left renal vein so there is also a portal system which is present in the suprarenal gland which is formed by the vessels arteries and veins okay so that is about the blood supply and the venous drainage which is very important for any endocrine gland
Lymphatic paraaortic lobes. They actually drain to the lateral paraaortic lobes situated on either side of the aortic aorta. It has got a cortex at the medulla. If you take a internal structure, it has got a cortex at the medulla. The cortex you can see three layers: zona glomerulosa. Then you have the zona fasciculata, and then you have the zona reticularis. Zona glomerulosa. Zora fasciculata, and then what you have is the zora reticularis. Zora glomerulosa mainly secretes mineralocorticoids. Okay, zora glomerulosa mainly secretes the mineralocorticoids, and most important is the aldosterone, which helps in absorption of sodium from the kidneys and excretion of potassium and hydrogen ions. So that is the main function of the zona glomerulosa. That is the mineralocorticoids. Okay. So in deficiency of mineralocorticoids, what we have the adhesion disease. So most of the sodium is lost from the urine. So frequent urination you can see at that no nocturnal urination and potassium is retained in the blood. The next is actually the zona fasciculata. They secrete glucocorticoids. They mainly secrete the uh, glucocorticoids, which regulate the uh, carbohydrate and protein metabolism. So cortisol. So that is the mainly from the zona fasciculata. It's a diatogenic in nature, but which is counteracted by the insulin secreted from the pancreas. The next we have the zona reticularis, which secretes the sex hormones. Androgens and the estrogens. So mainly it regulates your secondary sex characters. Okay. So that is about the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. The medulla has got chromaffin cells. So they are actually called as chromaffin cells. You also directly have sympathetic nerve endings, part of sympathetic system, which secretes the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. Okay, it secretes the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. That is also mainly responsible for maintaining your blood pressure. So that is why it is in close approximation to the kidneys. So finally, coming to the applied aspects, adrenal hyperplasia, so abnormal growth. It may occur anywhere in the cortex or in the medulla. It might be a benign adenoma, or sometimes it might be malignant. It might be a benign tumor, or it might be a malignant tumor. So, cortical tumors mainly Cushing syndrome, cortisol secreting, adrenal hyperplasia with excessive glucocorticoids leads to Cushing syndrome. So, excess secretion of cortisol. So leads to truncal obesity, then deposition of fat mainly in the upper back, boob-like face you can come across, then hirsutism in females. So abnormal excess hair distribution, especially on the face. You can also come across rashes, red rashes. These are all symptoms of Cushing syndrome, cortisol secreting tumors. If there is excess secretion of mineralocorticoids, aldosterone secreting tubers, it is actually called as Korn syndrome. So in Korn syndrome, you have hypertension, and uh, which won't respond to the antihypertensive drugs, and hypokalemia. Then excess secretion of the sex hormones, maybe the zona reticularis, leads to virilization in case of the males, mas uh, females, vasculization, or in females, sorry, in males, it is feminization, or in females, it is virilization or vasculization in females. So, pheochromocytoma. So, what is pheochromocytoma? Is tumor secreting adrenaline or noradrenaline produces paroxysmal hypertension due to large secretion of 
catecholamides which is characterized by the palpitations, heartbeats, abnormal and fast heart beating, hypertension, sweating and pallor and they are almost in the anxious state or anxiety. So, daily due to excess secretion of this adrenaline and non-adrenaline, the is called as the pheochromocytoma. Okay. So, these are the symptoms of pheochromocytoma. Thank you very much for your patient listening. We will meet again in one more lecture.